Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Hester, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Dr. Robert H. Couch Lecture. As the name suggests, this program honors Dr. Couch, who passed away unexpectedly in 2019. Dr. Couch served as an emergency medicine physician in the greater Louisville medical community for more than 30 years, nine of which he spent as medical director of the Norton Audubon Hospital Emergency Department. Dr. Couch's achievements are numerous. He was recognized for his contributions to medicine in the Louisville community when he was honored with the Lifetime Hero Award by Louisville Business First in 2017. He was a founding member of Southern Emergency Medical Specialist. He served in numerous roles with the Greater Louisville Medical Society and Kentucky Medical Association, the latter of which he had recently been elected incoming president. Dr. Couch was a servant leader who wanted to make a difference in our community and the world. In this vein, he is most notably remembered for his dedication to serving those experiencing opioid addiction. He was the first physician in Louisville to sound the alarm on the opioid crisis when he treated nine overdoses within hours of starting a 12-hour shift at the Norton Hospital Emergency Department. In the following days, weeks, and months, he continued to educate the community and beyond through local and national media interviews, as well as by speaking to civic groups and local leaders on the dangers of opioids. His particular passion for opioid and addiction, education and awareness led him to travel the country advocating for patients and speaking to various groups and lawmakers about the issue. In particular, he was dedicated to educating physicians and other healthcare workers to improve care in the hospital setting. The Dr. Robert H. Couch Lecture serves to inspire others to advocate on behalf of patients as Dr. Couch did. It is my honor and privilege to introduce our speaker for this lecture, Dr. Kelly Cooper. Dr. Cooper is the Director of Addiction Medicine in the Behavioral Medicine Department at Norton Medical Group. She is also boarded in Family Medicine and Preventive Medicine. Dr. Cooper has worked in integrative care teams and models of care to address effective standards, treatments for substance use and mental health comorbidities. She has extensive training and experience and expertise in creating population health strategies around persons who use drugs. She has worked to create new models of testing and linkage to care by building addiction, hepatitis C, and harm reduction programs. She teaches in adjunct professor roles at University of Tennessee in Knoxville, Department of Public Health, and Meharry Medical College School of Medicine. It has been a real joy working with her over the last year as she had joined our team at Norton Medical Group and pleased to have her today. So let's welcome Dr. Cooper. Thank you so much, Dr. Honecker. I'm uh very privileged to be at Norton talking with you today and uh, working with such great uh, colleagues and physicians and clinicians. Um, I will uh, also say, I, you know, I haven't, I, that was my first time hearing about Dr. Couch and I was totally moved. So um, I'm, I'm honored to also uh, follow in his footsteps um, in this, uh, in this uh, work that we need to do for this population. So without further ado, um, I'm going to share my sc screen so I can uh, start my presentation. Okay. Okay, I trust that everybody can see this. If not, I'm sure somebody will speak up. So um, again, uh, great to be with you. And uh, I would like to talk with you about um, medication assisted treatment um, and some of the realities and things that we have learned around how to treat addiction. And uh, we've come a long way. So I hope this, is, uh, this uh, helps you in your practice and also um, gives some uh, important um, uh, foundational knowledge around the issues. So I don't have any disclosures. Uh, I wanna just go through the outline quick. I'm gonna talk about the history of recovery and treatment, what addiction is, 
uh, how to diagnose substance use disorder and specifically opioid use disorder as well. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the evidence-based treatments involved in addressing specifically opioid use disorder and basically what recovery looks like today um, and, and how we perceive the future um, at Norton as it relates to addiction treatment. So I want to talk first about the history of recovery because um, we've come a long way and, uh, and I think it's important to, to look at history uh, uh, you know, especially from a, uh, an addiction standpoint, because there is a lot there. So basically, back in the early 1900s, there was there were really no effective treatments for addiction. In uh, 1935, Alcoholics Anonymous started, and this began with um, an inpatient hospital stay. They wanted to start f figuring out how to treat this, so they had a model of care uh, that uh, worked with um, focusing on one day at a time. And they looked at opioid ad or addiction in general, specifically alcohol addiction, but other areas of addiction as well as a chronic relapsing problem. And they knew because of the chronic relapsing issues around addiction, that in order to engage people and keep people in, in recovery, that there was they needed to accept them and re-accept them into their uh, AA circles. It focuses and it continues, it focused on and it continues to focus on a fellowship of people and peers suffering from addiction and a peer support network um, that helps uh, support people in recovery. And the other major mission of AA, and it again still is AANA, <clears throat> is that it's more than oneself. There needs to be a sense of purpose in somebody's life and um, a higher, uh, and a belief in a higher being. And that is one of the central tenets of NA and AA today, as it was back then. So previous acute models of treatment um, include uh, uh, ECT and prefrontal prefrontal lobotomies. We know that those don't work in addiction, um, but there were uh, various and even extreme um, treatments done back then uh, to try to uh, address addiction. And then um, there was a detox model, a detox with recovery model that came onto the scene um, in the Lexington Narcotics Farm, which happened here in, ten in um, Kentucky. And uh, I want to talk a little bit more about that because this really helped pave the way for um, a lot of the understanding around addiction that we have today. Dr. So, Cooper, yes. Dr. Cooper, if I could interrupt for a second, would you Please. mind enlarging your slide? Um, go to the slideshow from the current slide. Uh, hold on. Are you seeing it? Is it small? It is small, yes. Uh, okay. It's it's doable if we have to, but it's not ideal. I hear you. You need to go to slideshow. Yep. At the top. No, oh, you want me to go to the top. Okay. Okay. From current, hit from current slide. Hit, yeah, from current right there. From current. Yeah, it it didn't work, so let's just move on. Okay. But that's all right. It, it's good enough, Dr. Cooper. Well, you know, the other thing I can do <laughs> is just do it on the other... Uh not in the PowerPoint set, but that might come up bigger. Because I, I, I really do want you to see the slides. I think that's important. Is that better? We, we, can, we can see the slides, Dr. Cooper. We were just trying to optimize. Okay. Let's, I think we're good enough to go forward, so. Okay, all right. And, and that's all right. Sorry for the interruption. No, no problem. I, I, it's important that you're able to see the slides, so. <laughs> Okay, let's, okay. 
So, uh, so here, so we, so the Lexington Recovery Farm. So, back in 1935, this actually opened um, around Lexington, Kentucky, where um, it was a, it basically was a government-funded uh, prison and rehabilitation and research center. And um, the goal and the mission of this facility was to understand drug addiction, rehabilitate persons addicted to drugs fully and then also find a permanent cure for addiction. Well, unfortunately, we, uh, we, there was no cure that, that was found. Um, they weren't able to rehabilitate people completely due to it from addiction. And, um, but we understood a lot more about drug addiction because of uh, all of the information and the interventions done at the Lexington Recovery Farm. So, uh, so what we did, what happened um, based on the data is that more than 85% of people actually relapsed. And that included patients on opioids that were prescribed opioids. And there's lots of reasons for this, but uh, we learned that treatment of addiction is very hard. And despite all of the pieces they put in place on the farm, uh, which included work, uh, work for everybody, it included um, place to live, food, you know, they, there's, they were highly supported. There was lots of counseling and psychiatric treatment. Um, we, we also learned that when people left there, many patients relapsed and died. And, not, and a lot of that was due to law of tolerance. Um, people also, uh, in a longitudinal studies looked at, they, were, they actually died 20 years earlier uh, because of their addiction to substances. And so why did these interventions fail? Um, number one, back then there was a very misunder misunderstanding of addiction. Uh, and after dec decades of research, we know that addiction is a brain disease. It's not a character flaw. It's not a simple choice of to use or not use to say yes or say no. Um, it's much more complicated than that. Um, and then as a result, we now are starting to have effective treatments in the 1960s and beyond. So let me go into a little bit about what addiction is. Um, it's a chronic brain disease that's expressed by uh, a compulsive behavior. And that behavior includes um, what we call three C's, control, craving and consequences as, as a result of that behavior. And people use substances that they're addicted to despite ne those negative consequences. It tends to hijack the brain. Those substances hijack the brain and controls and, and, and the person develops his or her own drive and appetite and craving for that specific substance. And um, there are very powerful substances on the market today uh, that people um, can become addicted to, which we can talk about later. But um, because of the, um, the nature of these substances, uh, the potency of these substances, and um, how these substances interact in the brain, continuous use of these substances actually cause a rewiring in the brain. It, uh, it, it affects unconscious circuits, learning memory, and especially motivation and reward. So where are we today? Drug overdose deaths are on the rise. They've been on the rise for many years. And as you can see in this, in this uh, diagram, uh, over, drug overdose have surpassed many other uh, important milestones, which include car crash deaths, HIV deaths, and gun de deaths at their peak. And a lot of this drive of late has been attributed to the synthetic, specific, specifically fentanyl. So in, in the United States, we have about uh, four, over 40 million people that have uh, mental illness and mental health issues. We have about half of that that have substance use disorder. And as you can see, there's an overlap between substance use disorder and mental illness. And that is significant because even if, if you treat a mental illness um, without addressing the substance use disorder, um, you may not be very successful and, and vice versa. If you treat a substance use disorder without treating the mental illness, 
um, you also may not be successful. So it's very important to understand these co-occurring illnesses as we um, address substance use and as we address mental health in patients as well. So I wanna just briefly look at the drugs involved in overdoses. And this is uh, up until 2016, but I can assure you that um, these curves continue to uh, bend upwards. Uh, again, the synthetic opioids outside of methadone is contributed to a, a, a vast majority of, um, of overdose deaths. Again, that's going up. Uh, heroin is also in that group. The use of heroin related to overdose deaths is going up. Um, any natural and uh, semi-synthetic opioids, cocaine, and actually methamphetamine is also going up um, uh, more currently than 2016. Okay, so I wanna talk about uh, diagnosing substance use disorder. And um, before the diagnosis, it's really important for us in primary care to understand how to screen for that. Um, and I know that many people use SBIRD as a screening tool um, now, uh, and that's highly recommended. It's highly effective, um, and it's, um, it's appropriate for use in a primary care setting as well as other settings. Um, but the USPSTF came out um, in June of 2020, um, and this was, uh, they had looked at this in the past, but they finally had the evidence to show that as a grade B, that screening for substance use in the adult population is, act is very beneficial and it's effective. So if you have the ability to treat somebody or refer somebody for treatment, it's important that you screen. So here's the criteria for substance use disorder. And this, um, this changed in, um, this changed uh, in uh, 2013 as well with the DSM-5 changes. And uh, you can see that there, there's, there's a bucket for dependence and a bucket for abuse. And if, uh, if you look under dependence, there's the loss of control category. Uh, as well as the physiological um, issues around uh, addiction, which include tolerance and withdrawal, uh, as well as the consequences that I briefly uh, talked about before. So in order to diagnose substance use disorder, you have to identify two or more of uh, the above in the past year resulting in distress or impairment. And I, I, I stress the resulting in distress or impairment because people can be on, let's say, a long-term opioid, a long-term benzo, um, and they are doing completely fine on that, and they have no distress or no impairments, um, and that would not categorize them um, for a substance use disorder. So there is a bit of a gray area there. However, um, it's important to screen people for substance misuse. Are they, how are they taking their medicine? Are they uh, running out of their medicine early? Uh, pill counts, all of that stuff. It's, it's important to understand how, when, and why patients are using their, their um, controlled substances. Um, so again, tolerance and withdrawal alone don't necess necessarily uh, signify uh, substance use disorder. So uh, just be uh, vigilant and uh, about assessing that um, uh, from the beginning. Uh, so, in terms of uh, severity, uh, if you have two to three of these uh, of the above, then you would uh, qualify in the mild category, a uh, patient that's positive for two or three of the, the above. Um, if, if, it, if patient is positive for four to five, then a patient would have moderate substance use disorder. Um, and if they had six or more, then they would, they would be in a severe category. And this is just an example. This is the opioid use disorder checklist. This is one of many. They're easily available online. Uh, and basically, you just go down and ask the questions. And then you just total up the uh, whether or not they meet that criteria and just tally up the, the total. And again, if two or three is mild, four to five is uh, moderate and six or more severe. And this is true for any substance use. So this is a, an op example of opioids but you can do this for methamphetamine, um, 
cocaine, any, anything, uh, any, any substance of use. And then uh, that, that is how it is officially diagnosed. I'm gonna switch gears and talk about treatment at this point. Um, and MAT is called medication assisted treatment and MOUD, which is, is called uh, medication for opioid use disorder. Uh, very similar um, acronyms, uh, but uh, uh, just something for, for your fam familiarity. So what is this? It is, um, there, it, it is it, there are three uh, medications that fit into the MAT, MAOUD categories. The first is buprenorphine, um, and that is a partial opioid agonist. And that is included under in the buprenorphine is the buprenorphine monoproduct or a combination product that ha also has uh, it's actually naloxone in it. And then naltrexone is an opioid antagonist, and that comes in an oral and an injectable form. And then methadone, which is a full opioid agonist, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And so, why is this important? Why is uh, you know, MAT and MOUD important? Well, we've, we now have, we have uh, significant data around this. And this is old data, but this also parallels the Lexington Farm experiment uh, as well. And that what we find is the majority of people who have addiction issues wind up relapsing in the first three months. So the first three months is very, very difficult time for patients. And this is where, this is one of the key areas where medication assisted treatment comes into play. It's stabilizing that patient for at least that first three months, generally longer, um, so that uh, their, basically their brain chemistry, their motivations, that all of the pieces around addiction, their addiction and their addictive behaviors um, can start uh, turning a corner. Uh, this is another piece of uh, data that shows over time, as, um, the, if, if, if a patient is engaged in treatment, that their illicit opioid use goes down. The more they're engaged in treatment, the more their illicit use goes down. So retention in treatment over time improves outcomes. Not only does it improve their decrease in illicit use, it also improves mortality. So patients who are engaged in treatment have a lower, uh, lower rate of death. And a lot of that has to do with overdoses. Not necessarily overdoses, as we learned from, again, the Kentucky farm that you know, patients die on average 20 years earlier um, with substance use disorders. But we, we know that even from a mortality standpoint, medication-assisted treatment absolutely helps. So um, in 2015, uh, Kentucky Senate Bill 192 was passed, which increases access to treatment, specifically for medication-assisted assist, treatment. It also increased access to naloxone, which is the opioid, uh, which is the opioid reversal uh, uh, opioid antagonist medication, or Narcan. It also uh, introduced the Good Samaritan Clause, which I'm not gonna go over right now. Um, it authorized uh, syringe exchange programs and increased penalty for uh, selling greater than two grams of heroin. Let me talk a little bit about the evidence-based uh, medication treatment. Um, again, MAT works to reduce illicit and risky drug use. And it does this by decreasing withdrawal signs and symptoms. And again, that is critical in the first weeks of treatment because uh, many people relapse if they can't get off a substance um, simply by abstinence, which most people cannot. And it's because of the withdrawal. Um, if we can get the withdrawal symptoms under control, and this is what uh, MAT does as well, is control the withdrawal symptoms. Um, then people are much more likely for success. It also decreases cravings. It stabilizes um, their level of dependence just in general in their life. Uh, and that includes employment, et cetera, functional relationships. Um, it blocks, it also blocks the illicit opioid effects um, 
to deter use and decrease risks of overdose and dying from that overdose. So I'm going to go into a little bit uh, more detail about each of the medication assisted treatment pieces, uh, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. So I'm going to start with methadone, and I'm not going to dig, in, dig into methadone uh, too much because I'm sure you're all familiar with it to some degree, um, but this isn't something that any primary care would be um, prescribing. But I just want to make you familiar with, with methadone because this is an accepted treatment for people with opioid use disorder. And, uh, but it, it's, it's got its pluses and minuses like a, any other medication. So it is a schedule two, it's a full agonist. And as you look at the graph um, up here, it's a full agonist like um, all of your other uh, uh, um, opioids such as morphine or morphine derivatives. Uh, it's highly, it has a highly variable half-life uh, and it's metabolized by the CYPA3A4 system. So there will be um, issues around that, especially um, you know drug-drug uh, interactions. Um, it's got active metabolite, uh, metabolites, which can accumulate in tissues and it can also uh, prolong the QTC. Uh, it's the dosing for methadone is highly individual because of all of those above uh, scenarios. And the, the name of the game for methadone is you start low and go slow, and then make sure that patients are on adequate dosing for methadone. There's lots of pros. It's, it's been studied uh, significantly in the literature and in research. Uh, it, is, it clearly does have positive impacts on patients' lives. Um, there are also cons. Um, you have to get it through a, a federally qualified and approved um, outpatient treatment program. Um, and those many ha have, uh, many states have very limited access to those. Um, in, in cities, however, uh, they're generally highly accessible. Um, you have to go every single day. Uh, there's a large stigma around it and there's a large vari variability in the quality of care that patients receive at, at those sites. So naltrexone, and I'm going to talk specifically about the extended release naltrexone, which is the injectable form of naltrexone. And if you look at the graph on this on the side here, we're going from so if a patient, if you're going to put a patient on naltrexone, uh, which is an antagonist, which basically means it blocks the opioid mu opioid receptors. Um, you are going to this patient has is dropping. From from a full agonist, if they are on an opioid, they're dropping from a full agonist to an antagonist. So that's a, a very big opioid deficit that the brain is going to see. There's clearly a withdrawal piece that has to happen from a person going from a, a full opioid to a, an antagonist, such as naltrexone. And this is the, ba the main reason why it's hard for patients to even get on naltrexone, because they can't uh, abstain from an opioid um, and go through this detox and withdrawal even to get on to the antagonist treatment. And that is the biggest downfall of naltrexone. For patients who are able to abstain from, to with uh, detox off of opioids and abstain from use um, for about seven to 10 days, they, they're then able to get on to um, uh, naltrexone safely. Um, those patients actually have the, uh, the studies show that it's not inferior to any other treatments such as methadone or suboxone or buprenorphine. So, and that's what that first study, both of those studies show. Um, and then the pros for that is that uh, naloxone or naltrexone is not a, um, it's not a controlled substance. It's an opioid antagonist. It's not a controlled substance. It's not an opioid. Um, and there are no regulatory requirements around that. You can prescribe naltrexone for a patient, uh, but like I said, just make sure that they are opioid free. Otherwise they will go into an immediate with uh, and significant withdrawal. The cons, like I said, is it's difficult to initiate. Uh, and then there's some low acceptance rates on patients' uh, behalfs. I will say in my experience that uh, once patients are able to get on naltrexone, 
they they've done very very well and i will uh many many patients that i've worked with um have said that uh, naltrexone was just as good as suboxone if not better or buprenorphine if not better uh, once they were able to get get on that and maintain themselves so buprenorphine um which is also called suboxone subutex uh, uh those are the trade names for them uh and this is a schedule three uh, uh, a medication. It is a partial agonist. So again, if you look at the graph, um, you are drop, you're dropping a patient from a full agonist to a partial agonist. So I, I tell patients that instead of, you know, the heroin that kind of binds to those receptors and turns them on 100%, um, buprenorphine is going to turn them on 50%. So there's a bit of a, there's a ceiling and patients don't uh, gen generally get euphoric or get a high off of uh, buprenorphine. Um, buprenorphine comes also with the antagonist naloxone in it, uh, which is uh, which basically is is there in case a patient tries to abuse that uh, medication by either injecting it or snorting it. And if that happens, then they get quite a bit of the uh, antagonist and the opioid blocker, and they've pretty much just wasted their money. So most patients do not abuse um, buprenorphine because of this. So it, it does have a, have a uh, much better uh, diversion and safety pro profile as relative to full uh, agonist. In addition to safety issue, it does seem to have a ceiling effect on the respiratory depression issue as well. So unlike other opioids, full agonist opioids, the respiratory depression does not come into play with, with buprenorphine, which is, which is excellent for our patients and for us. So it's got a very tight binding uh, high uh, to the mu receptor and it's very slow to dissociate. It's got a very long half-life. Here are some of the regula regulatory issues around buprenorphine. It needs an X waiver. So anybody who prescribes buprenorphine needs to be X waivered through the DEA. Uh, that for uh, physicians, that, that requires eight hours of approved training and then submitting your X waiver um, application. Uh, it's pretty easy and basic. It's just going through the eight hours of training for APNs. Um, it is the 24 hours of training that's needed. Uh, and then there are patient limits for physicians, um, 30 in the first year, 100 in the second year, and 275 after that. And, this, and similarly for APNs, 30 in the first year, and then 100 after that. The pros, this is hot, a much more highly acceptable treatment for patients. It's uh, easy to do in the outpatient setting. Uh, it increases access to treatment and safety uh, as it relates to the methadone treatment. It, and it's highly effective, um, as you can see below. There's also comes in a couple of other, uh, there's a six month, there's an implant um, that lasts for six months. There's a monthly injection and very soon there's a weekly injection coming out, I think in the third quarter of 2021. So there's more options other than the sublingual form. Um, and the, uh, it, like I said, the safety profile is, is much better than um, other opioids. The challenge with buprenorphine is we simply don't have enough treatment providers. Um, it's a safer medication. Um, it's clearly effective. Uh, we just don't have enough people prescribing it um, to make a uh, population type impact and that, that's needed out there to reduce overdose is reduce, engage people in treatment and keep them on treatment um, through at least uh, the initial phases of their recovery. Um, it's also pretty challenging to integrate it into the outpatient settings. It's, it's a little, there's, there's some process things that need to happen for that and, and motivation to, uh, to, to uh, work with patients in recovery. So, um, there's some challenges there. There's a lack of or incomplete insurance coverage in prior auths. I have not found that to be the, uh, I think Kentucky actually um, does a fairly good job of that. However, there's always uh, prior auths <laughs> but with, uh, with uh, insurance companies that we as providers have to address. 
Um, and I want to talk a little bit about precipitated withdrawal because this is what patients fear. You know, initially patients go into treatment because um, they're early on in the addiction process. It's about the euphoria. It's about getting high. It's the the rush of everything. But as addiction continues in a patient, it doesn't. It's not about. It's not chasing the high anymore. It's actually preventing the lows, preventing the bottom from falling out, and preventing the severe withdrawal that they have if they stop. And that's normal. That's a normal pro progression of addiction. So um, this is this is this is what patients fear. And this, uh, if we and we can induce this medi from via medications if we're not careful. So if somebody's on a full opioid agonist like heroin or morphine, um, and we drop them to a partial agonist, they are going to feel some withdrawal. Uh, we have to support them in that process, and especially if they go to an antagonist therapy, whether it's um, using Narcan or Naloxone on a patient uh, who's in an overdose situation. Uh, will go immediately into withdrawal um, or um, starting naltrexone on a patient that still has opioids in their system. And so these are some of the signs and symptoms of uh, opioid withdrawal. And I'm going to kind of keep going through here um, for the sake of time because uh, I want to do I want to talk about naloxone a little bit more and how important this is in overdose in addressing the overdose epidemic um, in in our community. Uh, hold on, let me. So, uh, nearly 85% of overdose deaths involve fentanyl, heroin, cocaine, or methamphetamine, and about 40% of deaths occur while a bystander is present. Present. Three in five, more than three in five people who died from a drug overdose had an identified opportunity for linkage to care or life-saving actions. So with this, we're missing opportunities as it pertains to naloxone. So when is it appropriate to pre prescribe naloxone? And this is, this is um, from, uh, this is the, uh, this is the standard of naloxone prescribing today. So any patient that's taking for than, more than 50 MMEs a day of an opioid should be prescribed naloxone or, and these are not and statements, these are or statements, or if a patient has an underlying uh, respiratory condition is on, and is on, on any opioid, doesn't matter what the dose is, they should be prescribed naloxone. If they um, are concurrently using opioids and benzos, either illicitly or prescribed, they should be they should have a prescription for naloxone. If they're diagnosed with any substance use disorder or they report excessive alcohol use, or if they have a mental health disorder and they're on any opioids, they should have naloxone. Um, there's other persons to consider who are at high risk. Uh, and those include uh, persons using or misusing, using illicit opioids or misusing prescriptions, um, using other illicit substances as well, receiving treatment for opioid use disorder, um, and then the persons who have a history of opioid misuse, especially those currently re released from a cold, uh, controlled setting where their tolerance is now, is now low. And if they go use, they have a high risk of overdose and death. So I want to talk a little bit um, about uh, what today looks like in terms of recovery, and it's a lot more complex than it was um, back in uh, back in the mid 1900s. Uh, but we've learned a lot, and we've come a long way. And really, what we need to build is a community of recovery, and not just you know I, I say a community that engages with you know, the, the standard community as we, as we know it, um, but also our healthcare community. It's important for patients to have access uh, to medi appropriate medications, specifically MAT, um, to have psychological support and counseling, uh, psychiatric support for their mental health il illnesses. Importantly, primary care access, because many patients that I see have not seen a primary care in decades and they have lots of other comorbid uh, illnesses, either independently or as a result, directly or indirectly from their substance use. And again, they're, uh, the, the fact that they have a, uh, 
uh, their death rates uh, can, can be much higher than the general population is significant. Peer support also very helpful um, for people in recovery. Care coordination among all of these pieces, people, the, uh, especially the healthcare field and the community support networks, um, and then family supports. Very, very important. The other piece of this is this is a continuum of care. We want patients, patients um, if they relapse or they have trouble, um, it's important that they can go to an inpatient or a detox facility and then come back to outpatient. And this is kind of what, what AA was talking about in terms of this revolving door where some, sometimes patients do really well and sometimes they don't. And that's the chronic relapsing scenario of addiction. And we have to welcome them when they come, when they do relapse, um, welcome them back in because we know engagement and care makes a difference in their outcomes. And I, the last thing I would like to say, this is how you can get in touch with me. We are also working to expand MAT services at Norton. Um, I, clear, I see patients um, through referral, that's the referral below, but I also really wanna partner with um, primary care clinicians to really start treating um, in the outpatient setting. And I'm happy to support you. So please email me if, if you have any um, interest in collaborating and partnering. I would love to work with you.